Okay, we are in Job 31. We only got four verses last week, but that was by design because he is listing a number of things in this chapter where he is protesting his innocence. And at the end of this chapter, uh, it says, Job's words are ended. <laughs> at least that's one translation. And he does say a few more things later on, but fundamentally, his uh, rebuttal with his friends uh, ends with this chapter. And I think when you read this chapter uh, and you look at it through the lens of New Testament understanding and grace, uh, a number of things should come to your mind. There's a lot we don't know about what Job knew. <clears throat> from, <clears throat> excuse me, from the book of Job, knowing that this is the earliest book written, uh, we sometimes are amazed at what he did know. Uh, there's some profound theology in this book and amazing grace of God in his life. Um, so a part of my desire in going through this is not to take Job apart and why did he say it this way, but try to look at it and say, now, sitting here in New Testament blessing, how should we respond? And again, much of this book is him being on the defensive of receiving false accusation. And whenever you have received false accusation, or I have, what's the natural thing, even as a Christian? We want to straighten it out. <laughs> I don't want you to believe in lies about me. And, um, but another thing we've emphasized, and I think rightly so, uh, we see coming out again and again and again, Job withstood all of this because he had a clear conscience. And so by the grace of God, while he was not sinless, uh, he was not guilty of what they were accusing him of. And so he kept persevering and standing for that which is right and good. And uh, again, in that context, then you get to the New Testament and you see the one thing that God commends and says, you need to consider Job and the prophets uh, for their uh, perseverance during incredible hard times. So I think when also when you read, you, you open up to chapter 31 and you read and you say, time out, let's put this in context. Here's a man who has lost everything, and he's in incredible pain, boils and just, all, he's, he's a mess, physically. And so, uh, that puts, a, this, is not, this is not some th theory he's working out, this is life. So, uh, what we saw in the first verses is by the grace of God, he had made a covenant with his eyes not to lust upon a woman. And the material we made available uh, has some incredible helps to help us to win the battle. So that's why I want to make sure everybody got it. All right, so now, beginning in verse 5 through 8, he's going to protest that he was, guilt, was not guilty of falsehood. If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales, that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walked after my eyes, or if I, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat, and let my harvest be rooted out. 
So he's protesting that um, I've lived a, an honest life. Uh, now let's pause here to say for us today, uh, if somebody has a bad negative opinion about you and they're very evangelistic with it, spreading it all over creation, uh, what's the best way to respond to that? Uh, have you ever had success in persuading the other people that they were wrong? Just keep demonstrating uh, godliness, honesty, whatever, and let the Lord deal with you from that angle. All right. So, uh, Job was willing to be deprived of the fruit of his own labor uh, if it was found that he was, in fact, not an honest man. He understood that there should be some, some judgment. Uh, and, of course, he wanted God to back him up, and God is still in this mode of silence. But, again, if... If you're in a time when you don't understand and you're being falsely accused or uh, thought negatively about or, or whatever, uh, the most important thing is not what the other person thinks about you. The most important thing is what we know that God knows about us and what we know about ourselves. Uh, you've heard the expression, well, when they're talking about me, they're letting someone else rest. Or uh, if you knew everything about me, you'd say worse. And, and so we just go on and, and, and follow the Lord. Now he moves uh, to verse 9 through 12. He was not an adulterer. And this is not the same as his battle with lust, but it is, is related. Job 31, verse 9 through 12. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another, and let others bow down over her, for that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity, deserving of judgment, for that would be a fire that consumes to destruction, and would root out all of my increase. So he's proclaiming that he's been faithful uh, to his marriage um, and that he's not allowed even to others in his, in his world to entice him uh, in his mind. And as I was going over that and thinking about that, I thought about a number of situations where, especially with Christian people, uh, adultery doesn't start out with sex. It starts out with two people who are lonely and things are not well at home and your work relationship puts you close to someone and you start crying on each other's shoulder. And the emotions get involved. And, and before you know it, yeah, the bedroom comes into play. With so many, it doesn't start with sex. It starts with emotional, uh, sharing deep emotional uh, secrets about to, with each other. So, uh, Job says, you know, it would be wicked for me to be enticed and that the temptation is not a justification for the sin. Many times we will excuse sin because, well, I wasn't seeking this. It just sort of happened on me. Now, verse 10 is uh, kind of unusual and... Again, this is one of those places where you say, well, 
uh, from a New Testament concept, I sure wouldn't go this way. And this is a place, again, when you're reading a book like Job, you can't read this verse and say, well, this is what God's Word says. Well, yes, but it is not what God's Word says so far as giving direction to us as to what we're to do. It is what God's Word says as to what Job is saying. So, in verse 10, let my wife grind for another. Now, uh, some translations say, let my wife serve another man. Uh, the, the New Living Translation says, then let my wife serve another man, let, let other men sleep with her. John Trapp commented on this, on, uh, I think he was in the 1600s. Let her be his slave, or rather let her be his whore, and may my sin, which hath served her, for example, serve her also f for excuse. Don't know, know how helpful that is. But if that is Job's thinking, <laughs> it's way off base. Now, I'm, I'm not here to eat Job's lunch. Uh, who knows what we would have been thinking had we been in his shoes. But nevertheless, it's not something we're to embrace and go here and find an excuse for our situation. And the most important thing is this, let's just leave Job alone and, and think about our being in places of temptation and being in places where we have uh, done wrong and what will take place many times in our culture will be here is a man that has committed adultery and guess whose fault it is? It's his wife's. Well, of course it's not. She, she may have all kinds of wrong, but he is totally responsible for his own deeds. But we go all the way back to Adam and Eve. Blame shifting is an old approach. And this woman you gave me, Satan did it. And that is never uh, God's way. So the most important thing for us here, uh, again, this is a... This is a context where, again, we're, we're looking at a man who, by the grace of God, had not committed adultery. One other thought here is in this we can see that Job was tempted to adultery, but resisted the temptation. The devil's fire fell upon wet tinder, and if he had knocked at Job's door, there would have been nobody at home to look out the window and let him in. For he considered the punishment both human and divine due to, his, due to this great wickedness. So this is, this is on target uh, in, in what is taking place here. Now, on another topic, verse 13 through 15, uh, Job did not treat his servants cruelly. If I have despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complained against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? And so, some, uh, again, great uh, truth here way back from the Old Testament, a recognition that, that there's no one that's inferior. And uh, raised in Georgia in the 50s, there were still some who had the mindset that black people were a little bit less than human. And or they were okay in their place. And, uh, but they were definitely inferior. Um, but the South is not the only culture that's done that. That's, this happens all over the world. I'm, when I visited India, there's one state 
that if you were from that state, you were nothing. And you wouldn't work. You couldn't be counted on. Just put everybody in that one, one thing. So, but Job realized that we're all created by God and did not the same one fashion us in the womb. So we have no grounds to look down our noses at someone. And then he also understood that, that he was going to be judged. One person said, this section embodies a human ethic unmatched in the ancient world. Now, it sounds like Ephesians 6, 9. And you masters... Uh, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Ephesians and Colossians, I believe, speak about the relationship between masters and uh, servants. So the consistency of biblical truth all the way through. In, in a world where there is inequities and where people position themselves above others and it for a number of reasons and whatever again sometimes our role is just to model to model a Christ-like spirit of, of um, not looking down our noses at the person who's up there looking down his nose at us but to confess with Job God made us both and uh, from the whole of New Testament uh, teaching that uh, we are, and the Old Testament, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. This is true of all of us. So it, it, it solves a lot of attitude problems at the workplace, at the home, or the neighborhood, or wherever, uh, of just uh, seeking to honor the Lord. Also in verse 16 through 23, he did not victimize the poor or the weak. If I have kept the poor from their desire, or caused the eye of the widow to fail, or eaten my morsel by myself, so that the fatherless could not eat of it, but from my youth I reared him as a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I've seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or any poor man without covering, if his heart has not blessed me, and if he has not warmed, if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, when I saw I had help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder, and let my arm be torn from the socket. For destruction from God is a terror to me. And because of his magnificence, I cannot endure. So, what are we to make of this? Um, is it not good from time to time to, to have a conversation with ourselves and hear, hear these things that we know that are wrong, but maybe... We're tied up in our own world, and we just, we just let those around us, we have opportunity to minister. Or, uh, like in the book of James, if, if someone comes in the church building and they've got on a nice, nice clothing, nice, nice car, have a nice job, we look at them one way. The person comes in ragged, we look at them another way. Uh, there's a natural thing that goes on in our mind. We're not above this. So we have to make a choice to think as God would have us to think, to do what God would have us to do. So looking for an opportunity to be a blessing. And part of that is having our ears and eyes open, making a choice when moving in and about the congregation to ask questions. But what a blessing to, 
to, have, to create a, an atmosphere in a church where we can call on one another and we can have our ears and eyes open to one another. And, and apparently, Job was such a man. He was rich and he had all this cattle and all this stuff, but he did not forsake. He had his eyes and ears open to the people in his world that had need. And so it would obviously hurt to be accused of the opposite. And on all these things, he had, by the grace of God, had a clear conscience before God, but is accused of doing none of it. Uh, I don't see him uh, railing and ranting and just throwing in the towel. Um, and we can say, well, maybe there would be a better way to respond. Uh, but we have this whole scenario here where he doesn't understand, his friends don't understand what's really going on. And when it's all said and done, Job's going to have an awakening. This is an interesting point. Most of the good deeds that Job presents as evidence of his righteousness are simple, ordinary things. More than any one of these acts alone, it is the accumulation of them that is impressive. All right, in verse 24 through uh, 28, uh, he was not a greedy uh, or seeker of false gods. So he says, if I have made, again the word if, if I've made gold my hope or set to find gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great, if because my hand has gained much, if I have observed the sun when it shines or the moon moving in brightness so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied the God who is above. So, the obvious thing with gold, didn't make that his hope. The son, he lived in a world of sun worshipers, but he didn't join in with that form of idolatry. Uh... And apparently there was a custom, here's a quote, and when the idols were out of reach of idolaters, they would kiss them. And they used, and they used to kiss their hands and, as it were, to throw kisses to them, of which we have many examples in heathen, from heathen writers. So that was, that was an expression that's strange to us, but that was reflecting on a, a form of their idol worship. And Job knew that this was wrong, that idolatry is wrong. And, uh, and we might say, well, I, you could go through my house and you won't, there won't be a single idol on any shelf. But idols are not just that sort of thing. We can, we can go to a foreign land, man, the place is full of idols. And in a public evangelistic service in Delhi, India, uh, a nation of, is said of 33 million gods, through a translator I said to the crowd, uh, yes, I'm from America and we have more gods than you do. We're not bragging. But we have the gods of sports, the gods of sex, the gods of automobiles, the gods of whatever. And anything or anyone that is placed in a superior position over God himself becomes our idol. Uh, sometimes our children can become an idol or whatever. So... The problem with idolatry is it displaces God in the place of being in a superior position where he alone deserves to sit. 
So in, in verse 30, in chapter 31, verse 29 through 34, just more of a general statement uh, from another, another, another angle that he is living not a sinless life, but a blameless life. If I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, or lifted myself up with evil, or lifted myself up when evil found him, indeed I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. If the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been satisfied with his meat? Let no sojourner, but no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. If I have covered my transgressions as Adam, oh, he believed in the first six chapters, 11 chapters of Genesis. He knew about Adam, and he considered him to be a real person. Oh, Jesus did too. And uh, a lot of people in the pulpit today don't believe that anymore. Hmm. I think I'll stand with Job. By the grace of God. If I have covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the contempt of family, so that I kept silence, it did not go out the door. Uh, Job is not happy when his enemies suffer. It's, it's, it's easy if you're bitter towards someone and they start having a bad time to say it within our spirit or to tell someone that I knew they were going to get theirs. The chickens have come home to roost. He didn't do that. Took no pleasure in the wickedness of others. The love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, speaks of that same thing. Uh, he was diligent to provide hospitality in verse uh, 32. And on the, verse 33, the basic and consistent argument of Job's friends against him was that though he appeared to be righteous, he really must be consistent covering some serious sin and that's what made sense of the calamity that had come against him so Job is saying no I did not cover my sins as Adam who blamed Eve I'm sure Job's friends I mean culture human nature is the same it's, it's been common since the days of Adam and Eve to blame someone else uh, and so they assumed you just put two and two together. Here's a man who's got all this problem. God must not be happy with him. He must have been, we thought he was righteous. He must not be righteous. So Job, you need to repent. It's a, it's a, this is not a cold case file. This is cut and dried. Well, in verse 35 through 37, Job is demanding an audience with God. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. He's, he's, he's misguided here. He's thinking not Satan is his attacker, but he's thinking God is his attacker. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps like a prince, I would approach him. So here's a dramatic appeal to be heard. Uh, this is my mark. Uh, some versions say, here is my signature. Uh, this, uh, some people point out that in the ancient Hebrew script, used by the author of Job, this letter, uh, T-A-W, or Mark, was a cross-shaped mark. In a sense, therefore, 
what Job was saying is, here is my cross. That may or may not be totally on target, but just an interesting thought. That the Almighty would hear me. He wanted vindication. Uh, later, Job is going to repent <laughs> of his attitude toward God. He was going to find out that he had no right to ask for this or demand this answer. Now, one of the outstanding things that we must put in the mix with Job and our own lives is the long-suffering of God with us. We, uh, I think all of us would say, well, I'm not sure how I would have, would have responded if I had been in Job's shoes. And yet there are a lot of people in our world and we look at them and say, well, you know, they're responding wrongly. I would never do that. Don't underestimate your flesh. <laughs> uh, but while we're never to presume on the mercies of God, let us always be grateful for the mercies of God. Let us always look with gratitude for his long suffering. We, all of us have enough history to know that with, with, uh, with all that we know about ourselves thus far, God has been exceedingly patient and kind and merciful. That my, verse 35, that my prosecutor had written a book. He felt that God was his accuser, his prosecutor, when it was Satan, of course. Uh, here's another quote. What he was much too confident about were the things that he could not see, the things that happened in the spiritual realm, known only to the reader of Job chapter 1 and 2, but unknown to Job in the story. Somewhat like his friends, Job thought he had it all figured out, but he didn't. We need to be humble in spiritual warfare, especially as we evaluate the spiritual warfare of someone else. So the conclusion in verse 38 through 40, if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their lives, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. The words of Job have ended. Job is done arguing his case. He'll have a few more things to say. But we've reached, we've gone through this long period of Job expressing his pain. And agitated by his friends and him res res responding to his friends. And, and him wanting God to show up and to speak. And... Uh, It's been quite a journey. Uh, simple for us, but incredible for him. And good for us to look at this. We, we've been blessed in our lifetime. Uh, there have been lots of bad things going on in the lifetimes of, in the last hundred years. And none of us quite yet reached a hundred. Several of us are closer than we've ever been. But uh, for whatever else was going on in other parts of the world that are just unspeakable in the last hundred years, and whatever else people have experienced just unspeakable in the last hundred years, we've had a roof on our head, we've had food on our table, warmth and heat and transportation and so many things, and freedom, freedom to seek the Lord, to worship the Lord, to serve the Lord. And <clears throat> so all of God's mercies, and we need to be faithful in the little things because for whatever is out there tomorrow, being faithful in what I'm facing today is the best and maybe the primary preparation to be ready for tomorrow's test. You know, I've, uh, some of you have seen the thing that I've written called, We All Have a Story. 
and it sort of presents some of the things of my life. And not that mine's worse than anybody else's, but it just happens to be mine. So I've sent this out, and people I went to school with, in, down in, in high school and so forth, they said, we never knew. Well, uh, of course they didn't. I kept it secret. <laughs> um, but it became... I began to see it to be a blessing to see here's God's grace in spite of all of this. And people would say, wow. It started mostly in dealing with people in counseling. The men especially sitting there like this, probably not going to come back. Because they didn't want to be there to start with. And they'd drive home after the first session. And they'd tell their wife, I'll come back. Because they could see that I hadn't had a life of roses and no thorns, and there was, a, by the grace of God, a sincerity, and I knew what it was to hurt, knew what it was to fail. And so th we need to be realistic. There, there are times and places to tell our story in, in honesty, not, not putting a negative on anybody else, but telling in the midst of the story, here's how I responded in. Here, here is my sin, and here is God's amazing grace uh, f during that period. So it's a powerful way that God, because there are more people out there hurting than we realize, because all of them are just like, it, Sunday morning, you can go in any church in America, and most of the people will be wearing the same sign. I've got my act together, I have no needs, how are you? Good morning, how are you? Good to see you. See you next week. Cindy and I were going to a church that was about 190 miles away from where we lived to preach on a Sunday morning in Texas. And um, Cindy's a uh, person who will use up to the last minute. She likes to get to places on time, but she'll use right up to the last minute being constructive. I'm of no use to anybody uh, an hour before you're supposed to leave. Because <laughs> we've got to leave. You've got to watch the clock. And so if you go by my doing, we'll leave an hour too early and get there an hour early. So this is an occasion where we left on her timetable. So I'm already half hot. <laughs> and so we're going down the road and she's the navigator. And we're going the wrong way. And so there was fireworks in the car. And by the time we got into the parking lot of that little church, they were singing. Service had started. We got out of the car, put on our smiles, and walked in. It's easy to do. It's our opportunity to find out where we are. Oh, the flesh just came out. I, God's still working on me. And it's our opportunity to love the other person exactly where they are. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed. Lord willing, hope to see you here next time.